Hello and welcome to experiment 13 for chemistry 110. This is Professor Catrullis. Experiment 13 is in many ways one of the easiest labs that we will be doing. It is mostly a dry lab, meaning that there are not a lot of chemicals used in this experiment. Much of the work is actually similar to simply doing homework, and it will reinforce what you've already learned in chapter 10 from your textbook. So let's go over some of the topics here. So we'll be contrasting organic compounds with inorganic compounds, which we are going to assume are the same as ionic compounds. And the things that we'll be contrasting are the states, gas, liquid, and solid, their melting points, the kinds of solvents that they dissolve in, and whether or not they react with oxygen in a combustion reaction. In the next part, you'll be looking at the structure of alkanes, the simplest of the hydrocarbons, as well as alkyl halides. And then you'll be looking at functional groups and identifying them. So by definition, organic compounds all are based on carbon. So they will all contain carbon atoms. And essentially, all of the organic compounds that you will encounter also contain hydrogen. Compounds that contain only these two elements are called hydrocarbons, and alkanes will fall under that category. Organic compounds very frequently contain oxygen as well as nitrogen. Many of them contain halogens, uh, especially chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Uh, fluorine is less common. And some organic compounds contain sulfur, as well as some other elements as well. Now go back and look at the list of all the elements on this page. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, halogens, and sulfur. Now, do we expect the bonding in organic compounds to be ionic or covalent? Let's think about this for a second. All of those elements have what in common? They are all nonmetals. And as we've already seen, nonmetals tend to bond with one another using covalent bonds. So we expect the predominant form of bonding to be covalent in organic compounds. Thinking back on bonding, which kinds of bonds were stronger, ionic bonds or covalent bonds? You should recall that ionic bonds are generally much stronger than covalent bonds. That is not to say that covalent bonds are weak. They certainly are not. They are just much weaker by comparison than ionic bonds. So what does that tell us about the melting points of these kinds of compounds? Well, if something is held together by very strong bonds, then that means we need a lot of energy to separate its atoms and or ions. And so that means that we would expect ionic compounds to have a much higher melting point on average than covalent compounds. And we're going to just simplify everything here and say that when we're talking about covalent compounds, for the purposes of this experiment, we are talking about organic molecules. And if we're talking about ionic compounds, we're going to be talking about inorganic compounds. Which states are each of these compounds most often found in? Well, compounds that contain ionic bonds are generally solids. We don't find them as liquids and certainly not as gases at room temperature. On the other hand, organic compounds, those that contain covalent bonds, can be found as gases, for example, natural gas. They can be found as liquids, as in gasoline, and they can be found in solids as well, as in, for example, waxes. Which of these kinds of compounds are more likely to be soluble in water? 
Well, going back to solubility, recall that we said like dissolves like. Water is a polar solvent, which means it's going to tend to dissolve polar molecules as well as ionic compounds. While not all ionic compounds dissolve in water, many of them do. So we're going to expect that uh, ionic slash inorganic compounds are usually more likely to be soluble in water than organic compounds. However, we will find that some organic molecules that are capable of making hydrogen bonds are in fact going to be soluble in water. We will not encounter any of those compounds, however, in today's experiment. What kinds of compounds are more likely to be soluble in nonpolar solvents? Well, nonpolar solvents tend to be uh, solvents which do not have a separation of charge, positive and negative ions. And so the types of compounds which are more likely to be soluble in nonpolar solvents are the organic compounds. We would not expect ionic compounds to be soluble in nonpolar solvents at all. What is combustion? Well, thinking back a few experiments, we talked about combustion. We said that combustion is a synonym for burning. It means that something is going to react with oxygen gas. And when we talk about organic compounds, they react with oxygen gas to form carbon dioxide and water. So for what kinds of compounds would this be important? Well, if they're going to produce carbon dioxide and water, they have to contain carbon and they have to contain hydrogen, which is, of course, characteristic of organic molecules. So combustion is generally a much more important process for organic compounds than inorganic compounds. We're going to go straight into part A. So part A takes a very specific look at each of these last questions in the previous slides for four different compounds. So the first thing that you're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at some different organic compounds as well as inorganic compounds to see what their state and their appearance is. And then you will look up some of their properties on the internet. And for the purposes of this experiment, Google and Wikipedia will be just fine. Then we're going to carry out some solubility tests to see uh, what kinds of compounds tend to dissolve in polar solvents and what dissolve in nonpolar solvents. So the inorganic compound that we'll be looking at is sodium chloride and the organic compound is going to be toluene, C7H8. The polar solvent is water and the nonpolar solvent is cyclohexane, C6H12. And then finally, you're going to look at attempts to react both sodium chloride as well as cyclohexane with oxygen through a combustion reaction. I will try to uh, use a spark to ignite sodium chloride, and then I'll use a spark to try to ignite cyclohexane, and we'll see which of these is successful at producing a combustion. Here are the first two compounds, toluene and potassium iodide, described in part A1 in the procedures on page 149. Please follow the instructions on page 149 and fill in the necessary information on the report sheet on page 153. Pause the video if you need to. And here are the next two compounds. On the left, you see sodium chloride, and on the right, you see cyclohexane. Again, follow the procedures on page 149, fill in the necessary information on page 153 of the report sheet. Feel free to use Google and or Wikipedia to find the necessary information for this part.
Here you see me adding sodium chloride to the nonpolar solvent cyclohexane. Notice that the solid remains at the bottom of the test tube, and even after vigorous shaking, we don't observe any of it dissolving. I'm now going to repeat this test with sodium chloride using water as the solvent. Water, recall, is a very polar solvent. Here I am adding sodium chloride. You see it at the bottom, and when I shake vigorously, almost all of it dissolves, and shaking it a bit more essentially makes the entire amount dissolve, leaving it just very slightly cloudy, but almost entirely dissolved. I now repeat this process using the liquid toluene and adding it to cyclohexane. Again, recall cyclohexane is our nonpolar solvent. So adding toluene and then agitating seems to give clearly only one layer. It might look like there are two there initially, but that's just a trick of the glass. Now I'm adding toluene to water. And the toluene doesn't seem to mix. Instead, it's forming a separate layer on the top. Well, let's see if agitating it will cause those layers to mix. You'll notice that even agitating them does not cause the layers to mix. They remain uh, immiscible in one another. Here I have taken a wooden splint and am trying to ignite solid sodium chloride or table salt. You'll notice that the wood is more than happy to burn, but the sodium chloride does not burn. Here I have taken liquid cyclohexane, which is clearly labeled as flammable, and I'm going to attempt to ignite it in the evaporating dish. And you'll see it's only more than happy to ignite. I go ahead and I move the rest of that away. Don't worry, no buildings were destroyed and no one was injured in this process.